Darkfire Audio presents Call of the Herald, Book One in the Dawning of Power Trilogy, written by Brian Rathbone, narrated by Chris Snellgrove. Chapter 2 If peace cannot be made, then peace shall be seized. Vaughn of the Elsix As daylight streamed in through the open window, Katrin woke from a restless sleep, and she struggled to bring herself fully awake. Nightmarish visions plagued her slumber. Twisted dreams were so vivid that she had trouble distinguishing which events were real and which were nightmares. She pulled herself from her sweat-soaked linens, hoping the attack on Osborne had been nothing but a dream. Sleep still filled her eyes and muddled her thoughts as she padded into the small common room she shared with her father. He had left water in the wash basin for her, but that had been some time ago and the water was no longer warm. Katrin tried to wash away the sweat from her fevered dreams, wishing that she could scrub away the horrors she felt closing around her waiting to strike. The cold water helped clear the haze from her mind, allowing her to separate fantasy from reality. Her aching body brought her to a chilling realization. It was real. The attack, the explosion, the strange way she was treated were all real. On shaking legs, she dressed in her leathers and homespun, tears welling in her eyes as she imagined the consequences. Her life would be forever changed, and depression overwhelmed her. In an effort to feel normal, she got ready to do her chores. She donned her heavy boots and worn leather jacket, which had been left by the fire to dry. The jacket was covered in creosote stains and had a host of minor rips and tears, but she insisted on wearing it until it fell apart completely. Like a cherished companion, it had been with her on many an adventure, and she was loath to abandon it. After she strapped on her belt knife, she gathered her laundry, a washboard, and some bits of soap. If she wished to have something comfortable to sleep in, she would need to get her things hung to dry. Not even raising her head as she stepped from the cottage into the barnyard, she let her feet carry her across the familiar distance. It was a short walk to the river, and she had a well-worn path to follow. Turbulent thoughts rattled her mind, and when she reached the river's edge, she did not recall most of the walk. Kneeling on the shore, she dipped her nightclothes into the clear, frigid water, which numbed her fingers. She applied a bit of soap to the garments and scrubbed them vigorously on the washboard, but then she heard shouts coming from the barn. Throwing her garments into the dirt, she sprinted to the barn, fearing someone was hurt. The sound of several voices shouting carried across the distance, which alarmed her even more since her father and Benjen were normally the only ones about. She stopped short when a familiar-looking man backed out of the barn, waving his arms in front of him, and he came close to falling over backward. Two more men followed, both in similar states of retreat, and Katrin was shocked to the core of her being when her father charged out next, looking like a man in a murderous rage. Benjen swarmed out at his side, his pitchfork leveled at the retreating men. "'You expect us to live with that abomination in our midst?' one man shouted as he backpedaled. "'That hussy damn near killed my boy! He might die yet from what she did to him!' "'You've no proof of that, Petram. Nor do you, Burl. Nor you, Rolf. You'll take yourselves off my property this instant, or so help me,' he said through clenched teeth. Then he actually growled at them. A threatening step forward sent the other men scrambling back. Benjen had not said a word, but the look in his eye made it clear he would not hesitate to stick them with his pitchfork if they persisted, and it appeared as though the men might leave before any blood was shed. Massive waves of fear, embarrassment, and guilt washed over Katrin, freezing her in place. She wanted to flee or scream, but could do neither. Instead, she stood still as a stone and watched the events unfold, hoping to remain unseen. 
but it was not to be. The men spotted her and glared. What are you staring at, you boiling little witch? One man shouted, and Katrin recognized him as Peton's father, Petrum. She also recognized the fathers of the other boys. As they scowled at her, she quailed. The hatred in their eyes made her feel small and dirty. You'll burn for this, Katrin Volker, Burl shouted over his shoulder, but his speech was cut short when Benjen swung the pitchfork candle at his head, and the three men fled. The council will hear of this, Petrum shouted. Then they were gone, leaving Katrin to consider their words. Her father turned to her, and the look on his face softened. She stood silent, tears streaming down her cheeks, unchecked, and her lip quivered as she struggled to maintain her composure. Ah, oh, Cat, I wish none of this were happening. You've certainly done nothing to deserve what those sons of jackals just said. Don't take their words into your heart, dear one. They are just scared, confused, and looking for someone to blame. I'll take care of them, don't you worry. Come along now. We've horses to tend, and I need to make a trip to the cold caves this afternoon. He said as he guided her into the barn. Katrin's father had inherited the cold caves from his father, Merix. A popular barroom tale said her grandfather had won the caves in a wager with headmaster Edom. They said Edom had been drinking with Merix at the watering hole after the summer games. Edom's son had won the cross-country horse race, and he celebrated with Merix, who had trained the horse, and they both got too far into their drink. Edom bet Merix he could not get the innkeeper, Miss Olsa, to show them her wares. Miss Olsa was an older woman at the time, though not unattractive, and she had a reputation for being a shrewd businesswoman. Merix called her to his table and whispered into her ear for a long time. When he pulled his cupped hand away, Miss Olsa turned to the drunken headmaster, pulled up her blouse, and boldly revealed herself. Then she ran into the kitchen giggling like a young girl. No one knew what Merrick said, but the locals swore no one ever duplicated the feat, which made her grandfather a bit of a town hero. Katrin suspected he said something regarding the free cold cave storage still enjoyed by Olsa's daughter, Miss Maris, long after Olsa's passing. Benjen had followed the men off the property to make sure they caused no more trouble, and he returned just as Katrin entered the barn. Don't let those fools bother you, little miss. They haven't got the sense the gods gave them, he said, hefting his pitchfork in mock combat. On his way back to the stall he'd been cleaning, he stopped and patted Katrin on the shoulder with his overlarge, calloused hand. His simple act of kindness shattered Katrin's fragile composure, and with each step more tears flowed down her cheeks. Sobs racked her, and she stood before her father, trembling, her shoulders hunched forward. She could not bring herself to look him in the eye, and she stared at the ground instead. Her father never let the tribulations of the day disturb his routine, which gave Katrin comfort. He brought Charger, his roan mare, from her stall and put her on cross ties. He ran a curry comb over her muddy coat with one hand and smoothed the freshly brushed coat with his other. Charger was accustomed to his ministrations and promptly fell asleep, letting the cross ties hold up her head. What happened in the woods yesterday? Her father asked without looking up from his task. Peton was angry at Chase and Osborne for playing a trick on him, and the townies attacked Osborne on his way home. I tried to protect him, and they attacked me. I thought I was going to die. But right before Peden hit me, the world exploded. It's hard to explain. It was so strange and so very horrible, she said, and she tried to continue, but her sobs would not be suppressed. She hugged herself in an effort to maintain control while her father deftly unhooked the cross ties and returned Charger to her stall. After closing the stall gate, he went to Katrin and awkwardly put his arms around her. It was a rare gesture, which neither of them was truly comfortable with, but it meant a lot to her nonetheless. You certainly have your mother's knack for turning the world on its side, my little cat. It'd be easier if she were here. I'm sure she would know what to do, but we'll get through this together, you and I. Don't you worry yourself sick. 
it's not as bad as it seems, he said with a forced laugh as he tousled her hair. Now you run along and take the rest of the day for yourself. You've more than earned it with all the hard work and long days you put in this winter, he continued. Katrin tried to argue, but he insisted. Benjamin and I can handle things around here. Off you go now, little miss. Maybe you could catch us some nice bass for dinner, eh? Benjamin said with a wink, and her father shot him a good-natured scowl. I give my daughter the day off, and you want her to catch your dinner? Wendell said, shaking his head. Laughter released some of Katrin's anxiety, and she left to fetch the laundry she had abandoned by the river. After she finished the washing, she took it to the cottage to hang it up to dry. When she was done, she took a piece of waxed cheese, some dried fruit, and a few strips of smoked beef for her breakfast. On her way back out of the cottage, she grabbed her bow, two fishing arrows, and her fishing pole. There was more than one way to catch a fish, and she was determined to bring back dinner. Following the path back down to the riverbank, she turned north onto the trail that ran alongside the river, feeling as if every step took her farther from society and away from the source of her fears. She climbed past the shoals and falls, where the path was often steep and rocky. Along the way, she turned over rocks and collected the bloodworms that had been hiding in the darkness. By the time she reached the lake at the top of the falls, she had an ample supply of bait. Along the shores the water was shallow and slow, and the fishing was generally quite good. When she reached one of her favorite places, she laid out her gear. Dark red blood oozed over her delicate fingers as she slid a bloodworm onto her hook, and she wiped it on her jacket, adding yet another stain. Her fishing line was far too coarse for her liking, but good fishing wire was expensive. She would have to make do with what she had. After checking the knot that held her light wood bobber in place, she cast her line near a downed tree, which was partially submerged in the dark water, forming a perfect hiding place for the fish. A towering elm gave her shade, and its moss-covered trunk provided a comfortable seat. She leaned against the tree and waited for the fish to bite. The stillness of the lake stood out in stark contrast to the maelstrom of thoughts that cluttered her mind. She attempted to review the events of the previous day, but she could not focus. When she tried to concentrate on one thought, another would demand her attention, then another, and another. Frustrated, she tried to put it all from her mind. Her pole jerked in her hands, and the lightwood bobber jumped back to the surface. With a hurried yank, she set the hook and pulled the fish in, relieved it had not gotten away with her bait. The largemouth bass put up a good fight, and when it emerged from the water, she was pleased to see it was longer than her forearm. Not enough to feed three, but a good start. After baiting her hook again, she cast it near where she'd caught the first fish, but she got no more bites for the rest of the afternoon. The dark shadows of large fish moved below the surface, taunting her, and as the sun began to sink, she decided to try her luck with the bow. Normally, fishing arrows were only used when the carp were spawning, since they made easy targets as they congregated in the shallows. Bass would be much harder to hit, but she had been practicing her archery skills, and she hoped the effort would pay off. After securing her long string to the fishing arrow, she tied the other end off on an elm branch. Not wanting to lose her arrow, she double-checked her knots. Confident they were secure, she located a likely target and took aim. Ripples in the lake surface distorted her depth perception, and her first few shots missed their marks. Determined, she did her best to compensate for the distortion, and her next shot was true, catching another bass in the tail and pinning it to the bottom. Nice shot! Chase shouted from behind her, and she nearly leaped from her skin. Don't you know it's not nice to sneak up on people? She said, truly glad to see him. He just grinned in response. She gave a tug on her string, but her arrow was firmly wedged, and she removed her boots, preparing to go in after it. Let me get that for you, Chase offered. I can get it. I'm not crippled, she retorted angrily, and instantly regretted it. She had no reason to be angry with Chase, but she felt helpless, a feeling she despised, and she needed to lash out at someone. 
Chase took it in stride, though, and simply sat on the shore while she waded out to the flailing fish. She freed the arrow quickly and grabbed the fish by the tail. It was slightly smaller than the first, but it would be enough. The bruises on her hip and shoulder ached as she climbed from the water, her muscles stiff from the time spent sitting beneath the tree. Chase grabbed the other fish and Katrin's bow while she retrieved her pole and her other fishing arrow. She was grateful for his help. Without it, she would have had a difficult time carrying it all home. Chase was quiet for the first part of their walk, and Katrin allowed the silence to hang between them. I visited the infirmary this morning, he said after a while, and when Katrin made no reply, he continued, Osborne is doing much better and should recover quickly. He has a broken nose, a couple of badly bruised ribs, and a score of bumps and bruises. But he was awake this morning. He told everyone that you saved his life. Katrin grunted but said nothing. Carter has a broken leg, but otherwise he's fine. Chad has a head wound and can't remember much of anything. Heck, he didn't even know who I was. The master said his memory should return in a few days, but his mother is hysterical. She just keeps shouting that her baby has been mortally wounded. Peton's hurt bad. The masters won't say if he will live or die, but he did wake up for a while this morning. I think he'll recover myself. He didn't look nearly as bad as most were making him out to be. He stopped, and Katrin turned to look him in the eye. Her lip quivered, but otherwise she maintained her composure. I didn't do anything, Chase. I don't know what happened, she said, and Chase remained silent. The last thing I remember was Peyton bearing down on us and swinging his staff at my head. I saw my reflection in his staff, Chase. It was coming right at my face. How could I not have a mark on my head? She asked, not anticipating a response. At the very moment I expected his staff to crush my skull, there was a loud bang, like thunder, but without the lightning. Just before I passed out, it looked like the world was flying away from me, and when I woke, it was like being in a nightmare. I believe you, Cat. Besides, even if it was something you did, you were just saving Osborne from those boiling townies, he said. She didn't like the insinuation that it could have been something she did, but she couldn't blame him. What evidence was there to prove otherwise? She began to doubt herself, but for the moment, she clung to what she knew to be true. They were going to kill poor Osborne. I just know it. They probably would have gotten away with it, too. I'm sure they would have just made up some story about him trying to rob them, or some other rubbish, and that is just the kind of thing the masters would believe of us farm folk, she said. They'll believe worse than that. The main reason I came was to warn you. Rumors are spreading. Some say you're a witch or monster, and others have even claimed you're a sleepless one. There have been some who have spoken up for you, but several suffered beatings as a result. I don't think it's safe for you to go into town right now. Too many people have lost their senses, and they're starting to believe some of the crazy things people are making up, he said sadly. Katrin sniffed and wiped her eyes, but made no other sound. I'm truly sorry, Kat. I feel like this is my fault. If I hadn't brought that snake in, none of this would have happened. I'll do anything I can to help you, and I'll always stand up for you. No, Katrin interrupted. I don't want you getting hurt because of me. Keep your thoughts private. You'll be more help to me if you just listen and let me know what people are saying. Perhaps you could bring me my lessons? She said, but her voice cracked and she could not get the rest out. Don't worry. I'll bring your lessons to you and I won't do anything stupid, but I'm not going to let them get away with telling lies about you either. Thank you was all she could manage to say without sobbing, and they walked back to the farm in silence. As they approached, her father and Benjen waved, and they held up the bass in silent greeting. Benjen let out a whoop of glee on seeing the fish, and her father just shook his head. Benjen met them halfway. Nice catch you got there, little miss. Here, let me take those. I'll get started on the cleaning, he said with a smile. Katrin started to object but Benjen grabbed the fish and looked quite happy carrying them off to be cleaned and filleted. 
You go get washed up for dinner, he shouted over his shoulder, and Katrin was happy to oblige. She was wet, dirty, and in need of a good scrubbing. After she and Chase washed up, they joined Benjen and her father in the cottage and were greeted by the smell of vegetable stew. I knew you wouldn't come home empty-handed, little miss. I'll just boil the fish and add it to the stew. We'll eat like kings, Benjen said as he stoked the fire. Chase pulled the rough but warm blanket around his shoulders as he curled up in front of the fire. Everyone else slept, but he could not. His thoughts would not allow it. He had been ready to face the repercussions of his actions, but he had not been prepared for Osborne and Katrin to pay the price in his stead. He decided he didn't like the taste of guilt and remorse. Katrin was gentle and fragile, and he was supposed to protect her. He had promised Uncle Wendell that he would always look after her, but when she and Osborne had needed him most, he had failed them. Running his thumb over the locket that hung around his neck, he vowed to do better. Somehow, he would shield her from the harshness of this world. Wendell sat upright as he woke with a start. Darkness covered the land, and the wind made the rafters creak. But he was accustomed to hearing those noises. Something else had disturbed his sleep, but he had no idea what. Straining his hearing, he listened for anything out of the ordinary, but heard nothing distinct, only brief hints that someone was moving outside the cottage. Creeping through the darkness, with the precision of intimate familiarity, he dressed and reached beneath his bed to retrieve Elsa's sword. Touching it normally brought tears to his eyes, but this was the first time in more than a decade that he unsheathed it with the intent of using it, and he moved with purpose. Using skills he had long since abandoned, Wendell crept without a sound to where Katrin slept. Her chest rose and fell, and her eyelids twitched as they do only when one dreams. Seeing her safe relieved much of his anxiety, but Wendell was not yet satisfied. Perhaps the noises he'd heard were made solely by the wind, but he knew he would never be able to sleep without checking. The pre-dawn air carried a chill, and dense fog hovered above the ground. As Wendell emerged, the air grew still, as if he had somehow intruded on the wind and chased it away. The world seemed more like the place of dreams, and Wendell wondered if he could still be asleep. The snap of a branch in the distance startled him, but he could see nothing from where the noise had come. Could it have been a deer? After checking around the cottage, he checked the barns, careful not to let the horses hear him, lest they give him away. Shadows shifted and moved, and the fog constantly changed the landscape, but Wendell found no signs of anyone about. Still, his anxiety persisted, and he waited for what seemed an eternity for the coming of the false dawn. Across the barnyard, a shadow moved, and Wendell froze. Shifting himself from a sitting position to a more aggressive stance, he watched and waited. Again he saw movement, and he moved in to intercept. Out of the night came a blade to match his own, but before the blades met, he knew whom he faced. Was that you I heard sneaking around the cottage? he asked. You woke me while you were out here stomping around, Benjen said with a lopsided smile. We're getting old. Wendell said. I may be fat, lazy, and out of practice, Benjen said, but watch who you're calling old. Katrin will be up soon. I don't want her to know we were both out here like a couple of worried hens. She won't hear it from me, Benjen said, and with a wave over his shoulder, he wandered back to his cabin. Katrin was still asleep when Wendell returned to his bed, but it seemed only moments later that she began to stir.